Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC. Uh, before we get started today, I'd like to note a couple of administrative items. If you are dialed in on the phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSIAC webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say download presentation. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the webinar screen. Uh, you can use that to chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you would like to pose a question for the Q and a session at the end, uh, please click the 3 dots labeled more slash panel options to bring the Q and a window as part of your layout. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q and a for the benefit of those on the phone. I'll read the questions out loud to the presenter. Um, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, please have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Uh, check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the go to webinar button will take you uh, to the YouTube link. With that said, I'll introduce today's presenter. Uh, Mr. Peter Bagley is a cybersecurity professor at St. Petersburg College, Florida, and a cyber training consultant for several training institutions in the Tampa Bay area. He's also founder slash chief information officer of BNB Cyber Solutions LLC, where he has worked with several defense contractors as a senior cybersecurity engineer and information systems security manager, providing support for enterprise security and vulnerability management. He served 21 years in the Army as an information system analyst. analyst. Mr. Bagley holds an MS in information system technology from the University of Maryland and several industry certifications. Peter? Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Uh, hello, everyone. Hopefully you guys can hear me out there and see me pretty clearly. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for allowing me to come and kind of share some of this information. Uh, the subject we're going to talk about today is, and let me share my screen here so we can kind of get this going, is about the CMMC process, which basically is something that's going to be affecting pretty much every uh, company out there doing business with DOD. So let me get my slides up here. Here we go. Okay, fantastic. You guys see the slides? Everybody good on those? Awesome. Yep, we, we can see the slides. Just go full screen for us, please. Gotcha, I will do that right now, sir. All right, there you go. So again, our subject is gonna be, do I need CMMC? Uh, and the answer is gonna be yes for pretty much anyone doing business with DOD. Here's a little bit of uh, information about me that he kind of shared. Uh, this, Ordinary guy who likes IT and likes security and, and uh, starting to really enjoy more about the CMMC process. So that's what I want to share with you and kind of give you some insight on what you may be encountering within the next, 
I'd say probably six months. If you already aren't involved with it, you'll definitely be involved with it. If you are a company that works with DOD as far as providing services or products or anything like that. So here's some of the things we want to touch on. Uh, areas was called a FAR or DFARS, and I'll get into some of these details a little bit as we go along. The uh, CMMC ecosystem, which is a, a major catalyst as far as this whole program uh, is built around that. The uh, NIST 800-171 regulation, and also we'll talk about um, the Cyber AB. And some of these things have kind of changed over the last couple of months, even as far as some of the, the things that they're doing and some of the ways this information is being looked at because it's an evolving door. It's moving really quickly. Uh, so as I go through, I'll kind of point out some other things relating to uh, some of the current information that's coming down right now from the uh, Cyber AB about what's going on with this program. All right. So the first piece we'll look at is what's called a FAR clause, the 52-204-21. Uh, this is kind of setting a guideline, and it goes way back many years ago. This was kind of established. Um, so, as it states right here, the federal suppliers is contained in the federal acquisition regulation. That's what FAR is. And FAR has many different clauses that goes along with it. And the primary clause here that they're looking at is a 52-204-21. And it has 15 basic security controls that kind of tie into it. Now, for all of you who are probably familiar with security controls, those are basically things that we have to have in place to protect information, people, and things. So that's kind of where the control piece comes in at. And that kind of goes across the board with other regulations, like some of the NIST regulations as well. And we'll talk about those. Um, but along that line, like it says, the CMMC level one, basic FAR safeguards are translated to the 17 uh, level one practices. Now, there's going to be three different phases of the CMMC, and we're going to get into those. But... I just want to kind of give you an idea of what that FAR piece actually means. And FAR also is the guideline of protecting what's called federal contract information, which is a lower level of CMMC, which kind of falls into the CMC level one, which we'll talk more about. So here, again, kind of goes a little deeper into those 15 controls that we just talked about relating to the FAR. And as you can see, it's a whole gamut of different things from limit access to authorized users, uh, identify information system users' processes or devices, sanitize or destroy media containing federal contract information. So as you can read along here, there's a whole lot of different things that FAR kind of plays a role into. And these were the basic, if you want to say baseline guidelines that were in place that need to be followed if you were going to kind of initially get into doing some business with DOD back when it initiated through the FAR. Now, since that time, a uh, concept called a DFARS, which is kind of a, a subcontract or a sub area rather of the FAR, which is focused pretty much on DOD, Department of Defense, has come along and it's called DFARS. Same concept, Federal Defense Acquisition Regulation Supplement. And this is where we kind of get a little more into where we are today. Uh, most of the companies that are doing business with Department of Defense are kind of falling into the realm of the FAR as well as the DFARS. And like I said, here, the DFARS contains requirements of law, wide policies, delegations of FAR authorities, deviations, requirements, all the things that are needed for company A and B to operate in doing business with the Department of Defense. Oh, they're going far. Yeah, here we go. I'm sorry. Um, so the 712, which is a key component of a big part of the NIST. Uh, 800-171 and CMMC, the DFAR is 252-204-712. And like it says here, safeguard, safeguards rather uh, cover defense information and cyber incident reporting. So this is really all about trying to protect government and DOD data because historically there really weren't a lot of guidelines in place and there were some, but they weren't really being followed. So a lot of this that we're looking at now, what we're going to talk about is all about trying to protect government data due to ransomware and a lot of different attacks that are coming from uh, APTs and other organizations, countries trying to access government information, which then could cause a problem across the board for most of us. So like it says in the first area of the uh, B2, it says cover contract information system shall be subject to the security requirements of the National Institute of Standards Technology, NIST, SP 
800-171. So that's kind of where it sets the tone and issue for 800-171. And that basically is protecting control, unclassified information, and non-federal information systems and organizations. So to control unclassified information, that is the CUI realm that all of this is really trying to protect. It's not secret, it's not top secret information. It used to kind of fall into the realms of what we would call FOU, FOUO, for your information only. But now it's a little more designated tied to control unclassified information. And that's where this 7, uh, 7012 comes into play. Here's the second part of it. It says in 2A, the contractor shall implement NIST SP 800171 as soon as practical, but no later than December 31st, 2017. Now we're in right now in 2024. So as you can see, this kind of been around for a little while but it still wasn't getting all the support that it needed and it really wasn't focused on as much as it needs to be as of today, which is why it's changing so much to where we have to do these things. So like it says, uh, of all contract awards prior to October, 2017, the contractor shall notify DOD uh, CIO via email within 30 days of contract award of any security requirements specified by NIST 800-171 not implemented at the time of contract award. So we're gonna kind of go through some of these requirements that they have as far as the areas that need to be emphasized for doing these contracts. But this is kind of setting the baseline for us all as in, okay, now we know this regulation says we have to follow certain requirements to do business with DOD as a contractor. And we have a timeline in place that we need to act on if things change or evolve as we get involved with the company itself, working with DOD. I'm just gonna slide. Here we go. All right. So here is the first part we talked about a little bit earlier. FCI, uh, Federal Acquisition Regulations of FAR. And basically what it is, like it says here in the green, the FCI federal contract information is defined as information not intended for public release, provided by or generated by the government under a contract to develop or deliver a product or service to the government. So this is kind of a lower level of protecting information, but it still is trying to protect government information. And that kind of breaks down into a couple of different areas, which we'll look at in a minute. Now, here's what the CUI is that we just talked about. Control unclassified information is defined as information the government creates or possesses, or that an entity creates or possesses. Entity could be a company or person working for the government for or on behalf of the government, the law, regulation, or government-wide policy requires or permits any agency to handle using safeguarding and or disseminating controls. Now, we're going to look at these different controls because they break down in many different realms, as you can kind of see here where it talks about uh, law, regulations, or government-wide policies may require, require or permit agencies to control or protect the information, but providing no specific controls, which makes the information CUI basic requires or permits agencies to control or protect information, providing specific controls for doing so, which makes CUI specify and then requiring or permitting agencies to control information and specify only some of those controls, which makes the information CUI specify, but with the basic uh, controls where the control authority does not specify. Now, what does all that mean? Let's kind of go a little bit further. So this kind of is where we roll into this CMFC program. And that's the crux of everything we're looking at right now based off of the, the FAR, DFARS, the um, FCI and the CUI, all kind of rolls into this. So like it says, the program was developed back in January 20, the first version of it. Um, they revised it in November 21. And Basically, that's kind of where we stand right now. Now, currently, as of today, excuse me, guys, I'm sorry. Um, we have basically gone to where they're doing updates right now for all of this. And it's in a realm, we'll talk about that at the end, as far as going through the office of uh, OMB, rather. And they're going to look at trying to specify more detailed information related to how we're going to actually work with this program. But it goes back to working with this acronym right here, the DIB. Like it says, the program aims to uh, simplify the compliance processes, reduce the cost of burdens for small, medium-sized businesses, uh, securing posture of the defense industrial base. Now, the DIB 
is where everyone kind of falls into that deals with DOD, that defense industrial base. It also qualifies companies, what capabilities they offer. There's a lot of other pieces that kind of go along with it, but it is a main uh, point that ties into how this is used for the CMC program. Now, these are what we call part of the CMC ecosystem. Now, the ecosystem itself is made of a lot of different components. So what DOD did, they needed an organization to kind of build all this out, manage it, protect it for them, and also expand it and grow it. So that's where the Cyber AB comes in, and now they're changing their names a little bit to kind of improve the program as we kind of get closer to the starting point for it actually taking place, probably going to be in the spring um, of next year. But this is what they've put together structurally wise to allow us to have a platform to work off of and an ecosystem to manage and develop the program. So I'm going to kind of walk through some of these areas. And like I said, these are also evolving as time goes on right now, because this is kind of actually um, taking place daily, all the updates and changes that are going on with this whole program. So the first piece we'll look at is what's called a, um, on the organization side, is basically a registered practitioner organization. And that basically is a company that's designed to go out and help someone get prepped for this ultimate certification from CMMC. That will be considered what's called a OSC, which is an organization seeking certification. So let's just say I'm company B, and I now want to get my organization set up to where I can do business with DOD and provide a service or a product. Well, I have to go through this process of getting assessed to make sure I'm meeting some of those DFAR controls we just talked about, and I'll go through a whole list of those coming up, and make sure that I'm in a position to when they get ready to start the certification program, which is going to probably happen in the spring of next year coming up, I can then be authorized to do business with DOD and they see me as a company that has a strong security posture relating to what the requirements are from the DFAR program. So the first piece, like I said, the RPO, they're the organization, a company designed to have people to come out. Those people will be registered practitioners that can come out and look at company B and says, okay, here's what the requirements in 800, 171 states that you need to meet. There's 110 different areas that need to be met. And let's see where you fall in line as far as do you meet those numbers? And then they will help you prepare yourself. They'll look at your uh, administrative controls. They'll look at your technical controls. They'll look at your physical controls and make sure all those things meet the requirement a witness 800-171 states that you need to have in place. The next piece below them are the people that once we get to the point where we're going to start doing some of these certifications, they're the ones helping to train most of us up to get to that point. So you'll see the LTP at the bottom, which is a licensed training provider. That provider is going to allow uh, the training to take place that's approved by Cyber AB to allow a company or an organization or a person to go out and says, okay, yes, I am now someone who's been certified, been approved by Cyber AB, and I can go out and do these certifications. Now, who are those people? If you look to the right, you'll see the certified CMMC assessor CCA. That is a person or a organization that's hiring those people, and they will be the ones that literally go out when the program goes live next spring that can do a full-blown certification assessment on your company. So the RPs on the left side have helped prepare you. They've gone through everything that the CAs will do, but they can't authorize you as a certified organization. Only the people who work as CAs can do that. And then those CAs will come out and do your assessment. Now, what would happen is the OCS, which is company B, let's say, they would look for over here to the right was called a CMMC third party assessment organization as C3PAO. And right now there's only a handful out there. There's not a lot. Uh, they're growing, but they're, they're not to the numbers of the companies that's gonna need support. But the C3PAO are gonna be ones certified by Cyber AD, I'm sorry, AB, by DOD to say, okay, this organization has met all of their security requirements and they now can go out and they can take a CCA, for example, and go out and do the official assessment 
for company B to make sure they have now met all the requirements. Now, along with the CCA, you also have people what's called a CCP, a certified uh, professional. And that's pretty much the first level you hit before you go to the CCA. So the professional can go out as part of the team. So let's just say we have a four person team. That team goes out and they basically will have some CCPs, maybe a few CCAs, but there will be a lead for the CCAs that says, okay, I'm the lead for this project. And they'll be the ones dealing more or less directly with the customer, working with the C3PAO, making sure everything works out as needed to help get that organization certified. Then they in turn will be able to certify that back through the C3PAO. And now the company, company B, let's say, will then be certified to be able to operate as a company that is certified to work with DOD. As I kind of look at some of the other pieces in the chart here, and again, these things are changing. Uh, you'll have licensed um, uh, partner publishers. Like right now you have companies out there like, you know, of course, McGraw Hill, Cybex. Well, there's gonna be certain companies that are more or less designated that can publish material. And for example, Edwards is one right now, I'll just use them as an example. Um, for preparing for the CMMC uh, CCP or the CCA uh, exams that will be taught by the people on the left here, the LPTs, I'm sorry, LTPs, to help build an organization, uh, C3PO, that has enough assessors to go out and then actually go out and do the assessment for the companies that need to be assessed. So that's just a, a little quick chart there. And like I said, you guys are gonna have the slides and I'll go a little bit deeper in some of this as we go, but that's just a snapshot. And this is evolving right now because uh, we had a meeting uh, last month and a lot of these names are changing and they're trying to restructure it to fit more into a long-term program um, because there is gonna be more or less instructors, but their names won't be like it has at the bottom CCMC provisional instructors. They're gonna be actually permanent instructors once the program goes into place. All right, so this is the assessor chart, if you want to look at it as far as becoming a CMMC assessor. And, and this is the route that pretty much everyone's taking to get to that CCA position to go out and be a part of a C3PAO. They can say, yes, we have personnel that can come and do a official certification assessment on your company. So it starts with going through and getting to the point where you may Initially, you do your CCP, as you can see at number one, you do your training, your certification, and then from there, you move to your next level, which will be the uh, CCA, and ultimately pass that certification, and then, like it says, you become a uh, CMMC assessor, and you can or be part of an organization that's a C3PAO, who basically houses various different um, CCPs and CCAs that can go out as a team and do the official assessment for your company. Now, this is the C3PAO I keep talking about. They are kind of the linchpin of making all of this work across the board for all the companies that are looking to do business with DOD. So like it says right here, uh, the CMMC ecosystem, the sole authorized non-governmental partner has been authorized to set this up to where they then can say, okay, company, you're authorized to be a provider to can go out and now fully do a certified assessment for a company. So like I said, the Cyber AB is to authorize and credit the CMMC third party assessment organization. That's what the C3PAOs are called that conduct CMMC assessments on companies within the DIB, the industry uh, defense industry base and manages the CMMC ecosystem for Department of Defense. So as you can see on the right here in this slide uh, where it says the splits, you have the CMMC AB assessment accreditation then you also was called the CACO, which are the training piece of Cyber AB. So as the training is developed, as people become CCPs, then they become a CCA, they will then be working for a C3PAO. Now that C3PAO goes through a, a various uh, uh, different types of assessments right now that they can prepare to become that. So when we go live in, let's say spring of next year, uh, they have the personnel and they have the um, certification to where they can go out and now assess any organization to officially tag them as, yes, you have met all the requirements. So these are the 
pieces that everything kind of is governed off of when it comes to the re regulatory side of it, outside of the FAR and DFARS. And as you saw, when we're looking at it in um, the 7012, uh, talked about the 8171. And right now, revision two, rev two, is what we're pretty much basing a lot of things off of. Uh, there is a rev three that's coming down, but that's not going to be officially tagged as the um, guiding documentation yet. So everyone's still staying with re um, revision two. 171 alpha is where it's used to go into the depth of the controls themselves. And it will kind of peel the onion back. Let's just say you have a control of um, how are you uh, users logging on, for example? Well, that may be a basic control, but then when you look at 171 Alpha, it breaks down to various categories of how that could be done. It could be MFA, multi factor authentication, uh, it could be um, having a key fob, different things like that. It talks about different ways of managing that capability in more in depth. So that's how the two work together. But the key right now is again the 171 Revision 2. Now, this is how it kind of breaks down. Like it says, the framework consists of security requirements from 171 Revision 2, which is for tech and control on classified information in non-federal system organizations. And then the subset of it, which would be 800-172, which will enhance that as we go along. And the controls kind of increase a little bit more in 172. And we'll talk about that. And then ultimately moves into the CMC Level 1, Level 2, and Level 3. Now, this is how the CMC model breaks down as far as the levels. So level one is where there's basically 17 different practices that are in place. Uh, and it, it will align with the 800 going back to the FAR 52-204-21 that we talked about a little bit earlier. And like I talked about earlier with it, it's FCI, basically not critical to national security, but it is something we still want to protect. And that's where you can use what's called a self-assessment. So inside of 800-171, it gives guidelines on how to do a self-assessment for less, again, calling me company B for myself. I can go in and go through all the controls that are required to meet that uh, standard according to 800-171. And for level one, as you can see, it's 17 practices that are in place. For level two, which is where most people are now starting to gear towards because Ultimately, when the program comes online, hopefully in the spring, you're going to have to at least be a level two certification to be able to do business as a whole with government and if you're dealing with DOD. So there's 110 different practices that are in place there, uh, and they align more or less to the CUI side of the house, which everything, again, now is kind of focusing on the CUI itself. And that's where the third party comes in that will be able to do assessment. That's what I was talking earlier about the C3PAO. They will be authorized to be able to come in and do that assessment for you. When we get to level three, um, that's going to increase even more. We're not there yet. I'm not going to dive deep into it because we're still focusing on level two. But it does exist. It's being worked on. And actually now they're coming out with 800-173, uh, which is going to be looked at down the road. But for right now, we're just focusing on the 800-171 version. Uh, two, to get to these 110 different practices to meet the requirement when the official certification assessment process takes place in the spring to allow your company to do business with DOD. So these are the levels that we talked about earlier as far as in that previous slide, as far as the basic, intermediate, and advanced. Now, the level one basic, like I said, covers the basic security requirements for FCI which is information not intended for the public release it is based on 17 controls or more or less uh, requirements for 800-171. Level two is intermediate, covers the intermediate security requirements for protecting CUI. Uh, security objectives at the level is to protect CUI from unauthorized disclosure. And it's based on 110 requirements for NIST 800-171, plus 21 additional practices uh, for 172 when we look at 172. Now, the advanced is level three. And like it says, CUI is associated with a critical program uh, or high value uh, assets. So it's based on 131 requirements from 171 and 172, plus 34 additional practices that will be tied to 172. And again, I'm just sharing information relating to the 172 just in case you see it because it is out there. 
and uh, it will be looked at as time goes on. But again, right now, currently, we're focused on the 171 piece of it. So here's the level one foundational piece. And like it says, basic cyber hygiene practices for FCI. So all they want to do is make sure, do you have the basic things in place, company B, to protect information? Do you have a, a network stack in place? Do you have a router? Do you have switches, firewalls? How are you managing the access control list and those things? Are you dealing with the AWS bucket out there? How are you managing that? So all these things come back to what are you working with? How are you protecting what you're working with? And when you work with us, we'll be protected the same way. And that's a really slim down way of looking at it, but that's more or less what they're saying. And like it says here, the level one requirements are specified in the FAR, the 5220421, and the basic safeguards of covered contract information systems. And that's where those fall into play. This is level two, which is really now the key focus where most companies are gearing up towards making sure they can meet this requirement. Because if you meet level two, you automatically have met level one. So that's why right now everyone's kind of focusing on level two, because when the program comes into place and goes live, like I said, hopefully in the spring, uh, they're going to all be focused on level two certifications, not necessarily level one. And as you can see, uh, there's basically 320 objectives tied to it, which has 110 security controls. And it kind of breaks down to, like I said, each control has anywhere from one to 15 objectives. Every objective associated with control must be met for that control to be satisfied. And again, they kind of give a general example here. So level two requirements, like I said, protecting control, unclassified information, CUI, and identifies 110 cybersecurity controls across 14 different domains. Now, these are the 14 different domains that we're gonna be talking about as we go on relating to 171. All of these areas have so many subtasks and sub-levels below it. This is where that 360 that we just looked at, it all combines into all these different areas. So you only really have these main bodies that you're looking at, but under access control, you have physical access control, as in how are you coming into the building? Do you have um, guards? Do you have uh, cameras, CCTV cameras? That's access. Access control relating to a, uh, a router or a firewall. What IP addresses have access? Which protocols have access into your organization or not? Uh, access again into user access into a system. So there's variations in different levels under each one of these main categories here. And as you look at NIST 800-171 version 2, uh, you'll get a lot more in depth with it. And the alpha version, the 171 alpha, gets into the details of all those subtasks and sublayers that we're talking about. So here's the basic process that a company looking to get certified would kind of go through in the timeline. So for initial pieces of it, as you can see, um, you basically complete a self-assessment, and I'm looking at the level two right now. You do your self-assessment. As in me, I'm company B. I can have my company do a self-assessment of our own uh, controls and our own um, environment and make sure we meet the security basics that are in 800-171 to get close to that 110 number. And from there, I will put in what we're going to look at. It's called an SPRS score, which is called a SPUR score. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. And then once that's designated as okay here's our score out of 110 uh score that should be the max my company let's say gets to 80. all right i'm not at 110 yet but i'm pretty close and then those deltas the differences that i don't currently have i'll put into what's called a poem a plan of action and milestones and then i'll build a plan on how am i going to mitigate all of those other items that we have not been able to meet yet but at least they have a general picture of our security posture is in pretty decent shape, but we're not 100% there yet. So that's what that process is about, and that's what the results are all about. And then it's signed off on. So you have one year when you do your self-assessment. They call it self-attestation. And that is something that every company is going to have to do regardless. This is even before we get to the point where we're going to actually get officially certified. Then once the point program comes online, and you've done your self-assessment, you probably have gotten now a, uh, a registered practitioner to come in and do a uh, self-assessment for you as far as 
a pre self assessment to get you ready for the main one that's going to be coming down. Once that's done and you're ready, then you'll say, okay, C3PAO, I'm ready to get my official certification, get my official set of, uh, assessment of my company and my, our program to make sure we meet the standard. So then it goes through the process. The C3PAO will send a team out that consists of CCPs, CCAs, and they will then do a full blown assessment of your organization. They're going to be looking at the exact same things that were looked at for your self assessment or your pre assessment done by ARP. Once all those things have been met, and then you pass the level two assessment, then you will ultimately receive the CMMC AB certification. And that's gonna be good for three years. So every three years, you're gonna to have to renew this. So it's not, a, you do it once and it's all over. This is, it was like in IT and cybersecurity, we call it continuous monitoring. This is continuous monitoring of all those controls and making sure they still meet the same uh, standards that were met when you got officially signed off on that you met the certification requirements. So it doesn't go away. This isn't one of those things you just put in the corner. It's constantly being managed and monitored by your company. And that's going to be something that's going to probably create a position somewhere in a company that's, that's going to be their role. They're going to have to kind of maintain and monitor these capabilities and make sure that by the time you get to your recertification timeline, be it your self-assessment annually, or your official certification assessment every three years, your company or organization will be prepared to continue to do business with DOD. And on the right here, just kind of walks you through the general process of how it's going to be looked at as far as, um, you know, you identify your scope, conduct a gap analysis, basically saying, okay, company B, uh, you're missing all these items over here relating to a network uh, security stack. Okay, well, that needs to be fixed. Now you know what your differences are that you can kind of focus on. Now keep in mind now, this is basically the concept of how it's going to work. There's money tied to everything we're talking about here. Their resources are going to be needed. And there's going to be a big difference between a huge company, let's say like a Lockheed Martin or Boeing, that has the resources and funds to support this compared to a small business that may be, you know, four or five people they have to do the exact same thing because there is no difference right now in scale of a huge company or a small company having to be certified. They both will have to meet the requirements. Right now, that's across the board. So keep that in mind. All right, so these are the steps for preparing to get ready for this certification. Uh, like I said, initially start preparing today as much as you can because if you're just getting started, you're kind of already late. So a lot of companies start this process last year to get prepared but it's a good time as of right now to start so you'll be prepared for when the official program goes into effect hopefully like i said by the spring so initially like i said start preparing uh acting now is key to success and depending upon the level criteria you meet putting together required doc requirement documents so the gap analysis like i just talked about create that poem Basically showing the things that you don't have compared to what you do have. Because everyone's probably somewhere in the ballpark of not totally missing everything. You can't function as a company if that's the case. So you're probably somewhere in the ballpark or halfway there maybe. But you still need to figure out what the difference is and how you're going to attack that and build a plan to make that take place. Second, conduct a self-assessment. That's where I was saying me as company B, I can go in and do a self-assessment of myself as a company using the same criteria that the actual assessors will use when they come out to do the official certification. And then that way I know what I look like. And that plays into the gap analysis. And now I can get a better idea of where I need to focus my resources, be it people, be it money, whatever it may be. Then you consult with a CMC professional or a C3PAO. And like I said, while DOD has a website that vendors can use, uh, contact information to submit them assessments, consulting uh, with a firm, that provides CMC assessments, the, CM, the Cyber AB has a marketplace. In their marketplace are all the individuals that are certified to assist, for example, like RPs that can come out and help do a pre-assessment for you, or a CA that can also do the certification process working with a C3PAO. So it has a whole list of C3PAOs that exist as of today that you can go to and says, okay, we're ready to do our assessment. 
And that's who you would deal with when that time comes for you to actually do your assessment. They will come out and do that. So I would recommend make sure if you look for anyone or anyone to support you with this program, go out to the Cyber AB marketplace and make sure you have someone that's relevant out there because there's a lot of people out there now saying they can help and assist, which they probably can, but they're not certified and approved by Cyber AB. So always go back to the Cyber AB marketplace to get any type of people that you need to help you with this process. Fourth, prepare for your audit. And again, that's when that C3PAO will come through. They will do a full assessment of your organization, look at everything. They're also gonna look at your pre-assessment that you did, either the self-assessment itself, or if you had a, like I said, an RP, RPO, come out and do a pre-assessment for the actual audit assessments gonna be done to get you certified. They'll take that documentation, and here's why it's beneficial, in my opinion, to have a pre-assessment done by a third party, because you can do your own. That's wonderful. But at the same time, uh, you're going to be kind of honest with yourself and not 100%. Whereas you bring in a third party pre-assessment to help do a gap analysis, to help do the pre-assessment process itself for you, and identify exactly what you don't have compared to what you think you do, that only makes it easier for you when you get ready to do the official assessment. Because anything that was prepared prior to your official assessment just helps the assessors themselves when they're ready to do the official, make it much easier. You already have your documentation in place, you have your policies in place. Anything that was not asked through the, through the pre-assessment process, uh, it's gonna get asked probably in the official. So the more time you spend on the pre-assessment, the better off you're gonna come out in the end with the official assessment by the C3PAOs. And again, going through the assessment process here is kind of again, talking about this SSP. Uh, SSPs are what really comes out of that self-assessment. So it looks at all the various controls that are out there, the control families, and it says, okay, here's where you fall in line. And in that document, it states every control that exists in 800-171 that's a requirement to meet. And it says, okay, yes, you met it. And here's how you met it. And that's the other part too. You just can't say, oh yeah, we do that. Well, great, how? Because as a assessor, I wanna find out, I, I hear what you're saying, but show me how you can actually get to this, for example. And I'll give you a great example of it. Let's just say you do um, sanitization for any devices from a maintenance perspective that's going out from your organization to a vendor to get repaired. Printer, computer, whatever it may be. But it has CUI data on it. So how are you sanitizing that device or media to get the CUI data off before you send it out to vendor X? I, I wanna see that process. What is your process for that? Do you have a policy in place that states that? Well, you can say, yeah, we do. Well, okay, can you show me a screenshot of something you did to maybe wipe that data off. So this is the, the granularity, I guess, is gonna take place from a pre-assessment that you probably won't go that much detail in when you do a self-assessment. Because when the official assessment takes place, they're gonna ask the exact same types of questions. And that's why, again, it helps to have that third party even do a pre-assessment for you because some of those questions will probably be answered early. So when your official assessment comes down, you're not worried because it's already answered. You already have the documentation in place. You have your steps in place that you only use. If there's another organization that's involved with that process, they're already covered in, in your documentation. All those type of things, they all really help out a lot. And then the poem, like I said, plan of action and milestones, that does kind of give you a difference in where your um, hits are and where your misses are. And that again allows you to focus a little bit more on it. Now, kind of move forward a little bit because I know I'm kind of getting short on time. Um, the this basically is a slide that breaks down the differences between the 171 and 172. And I'm just sharing it with you so in case you see the 172, you'll understand the purpose of it. Uh, but like I said, for right now, we're still focused on the 171 uh, version 2. But as you can see, both initially, the 171 protects CUI, where the 172 enhances security requirements for the CUI. So it adds a little bit more. The uh, activability, uh, again, federal systems organizations on the 72 side dealing with the U.S. Department of Defense. Security requirements, baseline security requirements, 
on the 72 side builds upon the 171 with additional security requirements and controls. So it's a little bit more in depth. And as you can kind of go down, you can kind of see some of the variations between the two. Now, we talked earlier about the SPRS. This is considered what's called a supplier performance risk system. SPURS is what you may hear it called as. And like I said, it's a self-certification scoring method based on the NIST 800-171 control framework. And the SPURS provides contracting officials with a score of the overall risk of the supplier. The SPURS score must be supplied to DOD using a designated system. And a lot of times this is e-mask, and, and that's something we'll talk more about later on. Uh, once you get more involved with the program, um, whoever your assessor will give you information on that and how to put that in. But you'll have to put in your cage code and a bunch of other things into the SPURS to kind of get that information out there. But for for purpose of the briefing right now, the current scores must be maintained. They cannot be more than three years old. Going back to what I told you earlier in that previous slide, it's only good for three years. Even if you do get your official certification, you got to go back and get recertified. Same thing with your self-assessment. If you do a self-assessment, which is approved for uh, CMC level one, FCI, you still have to go back the following year and do that again to renew it. So this is just a general picture of what it looks like when you get into SPURS. Um, and these are some of the areas of to Like I said, the score is essentially a, numer uh, a numerical grade uh, the DOD can look at and says, okay, company B, my company, for example, I've met a general score of, again, I say 80, for example. I'll use that number. Well, do I meet the requirements? Not fully, but I'm not totally absent of all the baseline security requirements needed to at least get a contract started. And like it says, DOD is now using the SPUR score as a major component of the CMC evaluation. The SPUR score will fall somewhere in the range of a minus 203 to a 110. The minus 203 is where you start. As if you look at all the various control families and subcontrols that are out there, it all equates to a negative score of 203. What your goal is as a company is to get above the water. Being zero is the, the top of the water and you want to go from zero, uh, I'm sorry, from negative 203 to zero to up to at least a 110. That's the goal. Even if you don't hit the 110, the goal is to get as close as possible to it. Because as you all know, who've been in cybersecurity and uh, QRC for a while, I'm sorry, GRC, the Governance Risk and Compliance, um, it's hard to get certain things resolved. Example, let's say you have a patch that you're waiting on for a, a Unix or a Linux box, and it's tied to a system, and the vendor hasn't even created the patch yet. Well, that's still going to come up as you're, you haven't met the requirement, and that still will be on a POAM, and it may be 180 days for you to get that resolved. Doesn't mean that you can't fix it, but you just don't have the capability to fix it yet because it's the vendor that you're relying on. So from a risk perspective, it identifies, hey, you know this is a risk in your environment. I identify that. Yes, I want to fix it, but here's the reason why I can't yet. So that's why it's going to be really hard to get to a total of a 110 score in most cases. And they fully understand that. They just want to get a snapshot of where are you relating to protecting DOD data. As we go further down, this last bullet says the, uh, there are 110 controls with a maximum spur score of 110. And those control items range across 14 areas, which we talked about earlier. Um, and basically you have... Uh, examples here of access control, configuration management, all those items we looked at earlier as far as the family that needs to be addressed. Over here on the right where it has the uh, enter assessment date, this is how you basically go in your company here, they have company A1, and put in your basic information of where you fall relating to your self-assessment or if you had a pre-assessment done by a RPO or RP to get you prepared and a CCA as well can do all these pre-assessments just like a CCP can also. But I'm just kind of using the, the general focus of where these things kind of fall. And then from there, as you can see, you put your score in, you put in your, your plan of action completion date. So that will be your POAM. And if you have five items on your POAM, let's say you can have them all completed within the next six months, then that will be the plan completion date. It'd be six months from now. Uh, the SSP assess that would be okay you did your self-assessment or your pre-assessment you have now your system security plan which basically goes through each and every one of those controls 
that also will be put in as, okay, the date that was completed was whatever date that is. And you just kind of fall down the process of it. And then you put in what's called your cage code. And every company that works with DOD has a code that designates their company as being authorized to work with DOD. And this is some of the information that they're going to look at to kind of determine where you fall relating to being able to get that contract with DOD. Um, so some basic questions of what do I need to do to be compliant? Like it says here, again, go through the 14 uh, CMC control family requirements, require certification from C3PL when that time comes, when you're ready for it. How much does the compliance cost? That can vary. It can vary depending on your, uh, really your security footprint and infrastructure you currently have in place. If you're already at a position where you know after you do your self-assessment self, self that your company's, uh, let's just say you're at 75 or you're even at 50. Okay, well, that's not bad. You know where you fall, but now you need to figure out what am I missing? Do I need to get an MSP, which is a service provider that can go out there and monitor my system 24 seven because continuous monitoring is one of the controls. Well, then I need to pay those guys. Well, do I have the funds or resources scheduled for the budget this year to get those people? Don't know. But those type of questions also tie into the costs uh, of the compliance, because yes, you have to pay for the pre-assessment. If you have that done, you have to pay for the actual assessment itself. But I would not have the assessment done until your pre-assessment gets close enough to the numbers where you feel you're comfortable enough to say, okay, we know we can pretty much meet the mark. Uh, right now, that number, and I'm just kind of giving you a general idea, let's say you're roughly around 80, 90 in the, in the 110 range from between 80 and 110. That would be a general number to kind of go off of right now to allow you to say, okay, I think we're in pretty good shape. And because the program isn't live yet, and, and don't get me wrong, they're going to phase this in. They're not going to expect everyone to meet 110 score from day one. Impossible. And they know that. They're going to slowly phase it in and give everyone time to build up their resources, build up their infrastructure from a security perspective to be able to ultimately meet that goal. So that's why you want to start now to get a snapshot of how do I look, what am I missing, and what do I need to do to get those things online? And so, like I say, here, what are the steps to becoming compliant? Kind of went through those, engage with DOD, Establish a procurement account, obtain an active status. That's kind of where that cage code thing I talked about with uh, from the DOD side comes in. Do your self-assessment. Understand the scope of the assessment. And the scope is a big part of it because it literally builds out exactly what you're trying to focus on. Now, I tell you this also to tell you something else. Not every company may just strictly be a DOD company as far as that's your only customer. You may have commercial companies that are not tied to DOD. If they're not tied to DOD, the requirement to meet 800-171 does not fit the commercial side if they're not relating to doing business with the Department of Defense. If it is, then yes, you must meet that. And oh, by the way, if you do have an MSSP or an MSP as your service provider, they also need to meet that requirement. And if they don't, they have to be able to meet a FAR requirement that's in place to allow them, I'm sorry, a, a FedRAMP requirement that says that they meet pretty much the exact same standards that the NIST 800 requirement would be for CMMC. So kind of keep that in mind that if you're not a company doing DOD business, this isn't a requirement that really has to come down into your area. Now, recommendation-wise, I would say why not? Go ahead and get it done because who knows, you may change your business model later and move into DOD or have some of it involved with DOD. And if you already have this in place, you don't have to worry about it. Um, again, continue on with the steps again, develop a plan, submit assessment scope, uh, get the C3PAO to do the assessment and pass your certification. And then what are the CMC compliance deadlines? These are kind of what's out there for right now. Uh, and like it says here, the contract will require certification by October of 25. Uh, maybe, it may get moved up because it sounds like right now, they're trying to uh, do some timeline increases because of the need uh, for the security uh, baseline and footprint to be in place by the companies dealing with DOD as of now. So that probably is going to change, but that was at the time, the rough estimate of when they were expecting it to come down. So that's as of now, these are some of the resources that I use and it's a little bit about me. Now I'm gonna come back to the slide, but I wanna share something else with you guys real quick before 
uh, we'll go to the Q&A. Because as of right now, let me stop sharing this screen. And I'm going to share another screen with you. Um, I want you guys to be familiar with this site. If you're kind of new to the process. And is that the right one? Yes, here we go. Okay, you guys seeing, hopefully my screen here relating to um, uh, the CIO. This is a site you wanna go to, and I'll have all this stuff I'm gonna put into the chat so you guys can have all these links to go there and take a look at them. But this is where you wanna go to stay abreast of what's going on right now with the CMMC program. And as you can see, as you look at it, it covers everything from the C3PAO process, uh, who will be performing third-party assessments, will the results of my assessment be public, Will the DOD see my results? All these different things are gonna be looked at here. Um, and I'll just kind of click on this one right here, for example. Here's the information on C3PAO. Notice it takes you out to the CMMC AB website. It has all the information relating to this whole program tied to the uh, Cyber AB website. And now they're considering themselves as CMC AB. So that, that's one of the changes that just came down a couple of months back. So like I said, this thing is evolving very quickly. Uh, other areas in here you can look at, implementation process, what it takes to do that. And as you see right here, it talks about the um, site will be limited during the CMC rulemaking process. Now, I wanna take you to that rulemaking process real quick, just to kind of show you what they're talking about. Um, I'm sure I have the right one for you guys. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think I have that link to it right now, but you can access it through here. Um, but the other thing I wanted to share with you real quick is this right here. And I hope you guys can see this. This is something that came down a little while back. And this is why this is so important, what we're talking about right now. In the past, like I said, DOD has not really held strong to organizations not meeting security requirements to manage DOD data or do business with DOD. Well, that's changed. And this is recently, uh, DOD more or less, or the US government has now sued Georgia Tech uh, in Atlanta due to um, some fails that they had from when they said they did meet all these requirements. Remember the 110 I was just talking about? Well, more or less they said they had met these when they really didn't. Um, because again, the program has been around since 2017, so it's not like it's just starting, but they didn't put a real big emphasis on it, but now it's kind of picked up steam and, and they're really going after people who submit false spur scores. Like I just talked to you about looking into the supply system there, those scores matter. And what they're basically saying here, and I'll put the link out here for this as well, is that Georgia Tech basically had money sent to them for DOD contracts. And in turn, Georgia Tech says, yes, we meet all the security requirements needed to do business and protect DOD information. Not totally true. And after going back, looking through it, they found out, the US government, found out that they did not. And so now they're being sued. Now, I'm not gonna read through this whole thing. I'll send you the link so you can take a look at it uh, because it plays a big part in why we now have to do what we have to do as a company doing business with DOD because they're getting very strict on this process. All right, so I wanna share that with you. Like I said, I'll put it into the chat so everyone can take a look at it. And I'll stop sharing for right now. And I think I'm back here. All right, so I think that's a general base of information on CMMC. There's a lot more out there. I would highly recommend. Uh, there is a LinkedIn group out there for CMMC, follow them. Uh, there's a Discord channel. There's so many different avenues. There's a Reddit uh, channel for CMMC. Definitely get engaged and follow some of these organizations and find out, and the individuals as well that are out there. Go to some of the conferences. Uh, I think the next big one that's coming up that I'm aware of, I think I'm going to this one's going to be in November in the uh, Washington, D.C. area. Uh, it's going to be where it's the last one for the East Coast for the year, and they're going to be diving even deeper into a lot of this. And then every month, uh, CMCAB, they host a monthly meeting online for those who are interested in finding information on what's currently taking place for CMMC. 
and they go through all the things relating to what's going on from the, the government standpoint, what's going on with the organization standpoint, certification wise, as far as what certifications are being moved and changed, names being changed for the, the practitioners, for the uh, the instructors, all those things are through this. So all you need to go out is to the um, CMCAB site and sign up and you can get on that distro list. They'll email you when they do the webcast and you can listen directly from the heads of uh, CMCAB to get more information on that. All right, so I think that's all I have for right now. Uh, are there any questions? I'll kind of open up the questions right now if you have some. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, very oh, informative. You're welcome. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat as well as the Q and A. Uh, so sure. we'll open that up now. Um, I know okay. it's one o'clock, uh, but we'll continue this um, as long as you guys have questions. So uh, feel free to put any that you have uh, within the Q and A now. But uh, we'll step through those now. Um, our first question from JD says, can the C3PAO be a part of my company? The answer could be yes, but it's gonna be quite expensive to get it done. Um, being a C3PAO is a, a full blown process, kind of like we're talking about right now that, let's say again, I call myself company B, I would have to go through to get certified. To be a C3PAO, you have to go through an even a more stringent process to get certified that your company itself meets all the requirements and there's FedRAMP certifications and things like that are in place that will qualify them to be a C3PAO. So yes, you can, but it is a very expensive process to get it done. Once you get it done though, you then will be on that marketplace from CMCAB that people can come to when it's time to get the official certification and you can go out and uh, help them get certified. Thank you. Uh, separate question also from JD. Um, with, regard, with regard to SPURS, what happened to the 21 additional practices from special publication 800-172? So they're not focusing 100% on those additional uh, controls right now. That's where it kind of kept going back to, as of today, what has been said, the official uh, regulation that we're fo focusing on rather is the 800 uh, rev 2 uh, which are the 110 that we've been talking about through the presentation. I, I bought the 172 up because if you see it or hear about it, I want you to have an idea what it was and, and how it's going to be used. But as of today, not really being focused on it's stri strictly pretty much the 171 uh, version 2. Thank you. Uh, next question from Eddie. Would a subcontractor need to be CMMC in order to boot to do business under the prime who is CMC CMMC? Okay. Um, I want to say yes, but it's not where you have to. Now, let me explain what I mean. So let's just say you are a sub for, I don't know, um, Raytheon. I, I'm just grabbing the coming out the air. And you're a sub, your business is subbing to Raytheon. And you're doing business with DOD through Raytheon. So let's just say Raytheon want to contract at the Pentagon and you're now working under Raytheon as a subcontractor at the Pentagon. Well, if you're not your company itself using or passing any CUI data yourself to the government and to Raytheon, then you probably can get away with using a Raytheon device, using a Raytheon portal with their device and passing information back and forth. That is where you would not have to be. If you are though, passing CUI data back and forth to Raytheon or to the government directly, then yes, you will have to be. Cautious statement from my perspective, I would recommend look at trying to become one because eventually over time, that subcontractor may become a prime. And if you become a prime, you don't need it anyway. So you can at least get started, but it will not prevent you as long as your prime is already certified and you're using their tools and capabilities to communicate back and forth, then that also kind of puts you off to the side as your company is not engaged in the CU outside, you're using their material. But I always say focus on getting it done yourself. Thank you. Uh, next question from Aswani. I'm wondering who covers the cost of these compliance efforts and approval processes? <laughs> Great question. Uh, do like this, come right back to you because in the end, the government's not gonna pay you to get certified to work with them. You're coming to them to do business. They're not coming necessarily to you. Then that's how they more or less see it. So if you want to do the business with them, 
you and your company need to make sure you meet the requirements and standards that they need to conduct that business. Um, a follow up question, um, high level, but this, I think is a good question to ask. We get okay. this a lot. Are these requirements and certifications for doing business with the DOD or the entire federal government? Well, right now it's tied to DOD, but this is growing now. And a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, because of the way this program is coming about and basically really all it's doing is creating a baseline security uh, environment for any company doing business as a whole with any government entity. This is now also moving to the, to the perspective of universities and colleges as well. So it's not just going to be, you know, small company or big company working with the government. It's also going to now branch into the college side. Like we just talked about with the Georgia Tech piece and that, like I said, I'll share that with you guys so you can get it. Um, they are a university and they're also now required to do that. If you're expecting to get funds from that DOD side, and like I said, it's going to ultimately come across the board government wide. Uh, but right now, DOD is the primary focus. Uh, you're going to have to. So I would, again, go back to, if you know it's going to come down sooner or later, just go ahead and start getting prepared now. Uh, next question, you state the SS SSP and POEM mm -hmm. must be submitted in the DOD's template. Where can we find this template? Previous guidance allowed your own format. Yeah, so that site that I was just pointing you to for uh, CMMC, everything CMMC, CMMC from the DOD, you can go there and it has links to all these documents that you were talking about, like the SSP, there's a sample out there. And a lot of stuff, you can Google it out there as well. Uh, there's samples for the um, actual uh, Excel spreadsheets you can use if you're using that to do the assessment of the controls from 800 That exists out there as well. So there's a lot of different tools that exist and templates that you can use to start working for your own company and kind of going through the process. But yeah, I'll, like I said, I'll post that link out there. Let me, in fact, let me do that right now while we're talking about it. So I don't forget. Um, here's one. This is the CMC one here. And that way you guys can just go there. Yeah, here's this. I'll put this in the chat for you. All right, that's the one for CMC implementation, and like I said, it's coverage. Every, it's from the CIO, Chief Information Office, um, for DOD. So that's a great place to start. Um, and this is the article I was telling you about relating to Georgia Tech, just so you guys will have it as well. And you can do more research on this too, just so you uh, can kind of get a better understanding of what's going on. And what I will do also is let me get the Cyber AB um, site up for you, and I'll share that link. Are there any other questions while I'm pulling this up? Because I can do two things at one time, I think. Yeah. Uh, our next question says, what if the score, what if the score is, let's say, 95, ends up in a situation where one of the critical requirements is not met? So, great question. And this is where we are right now relating to uh, DOD um, and, and working with some of the other organizations to kind of figure out all these specified areas like that. So good example, and, and this is one of the issues right now they're looking at as far as like it was saying, it's going through uh, the rule updates and things like that now as of the whole process. Uh, they want you to put, again, let's say me, company B wants, they want me to put my information uh, in SPURS to meet the requirement. But if I don't have access to, let's say um, a, a certain site, and email, I use EMAS for all you guys to do accreditations and things like that. That's the government system you to post information. Um, how can I do that? One or two, if I am a DOD entity and I want to look at that information, I can pull it down for my primary company. But someone just talked about being a sub, I may not be able to see the subs information. So there's a lot of things right now that aren't exact yet that everyone's kind of waiting on them to kind of work those kinks out is the best way to put it, which is why, you know, it's not officially on the street yet as you have to meet this requirement as of right now today. Those are things you're still working through, but um, the higher the score, the better. And at the same time, if you do have a poem in place, you can submit that poem too, letting them know that, okay, here's the reason why. 
but you also must be able to put in there a timeline when you think you can meet it. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Thank you. Our next question uh, ironically mentions EMAS as well. Uh, okay. Marianne says, we use EMAS to assess our product, quote unquote, weapon system that we fill. This right. is assessing a single product or a company. Is is this assessing a single product or a company? Our PM may only buy one product from a defense company. Can you explain how this will help our PMs deliver a more cyber secure product? Okay, yeah, no, great question. So I hate to say you're gonna have to regardless, but it's kind of somewhat in that realm. And here's what I mean. Let's just say you are the company that makes that one widget for all of the, the planes that are out there at DOD purchases. Well, that one widget, it may be just that one item, but the information is shared back and forth on creating that widget and how it's going to be used and where it's going to be placed and who's going to be using it is CUI. So now you're in the CUI realm, which means even though it's just that one widget, you're still going to have to have a security infrastructure in place to meet the requirement because of that one widget. Now you can, and some organizations have, they've separated their infrastructure where they have a CUI infrastructure and that infrastructure itself meets the requirement. But on the other side, this is where I was telling you earlier, if you're working with commercial entities that aren't involved with DOD business at all, that, that enclave, for example, they need to be in that realm. So you have to really look at what the fight is. But again, if that's one widget and you're dealing with CUI data as a prime, um, yeah, you're gonna have to meet the requirement. Thank you. Uh, our next question from Blake. One problem in the past seven years is that there was not enough 3PAO assessors to enforce certification requirements. Yep. Do you think there is enough now? DOD deals with thousands of contractors. Nope, that's, that's part of the problem right now. Uh, it, it's more people with the need to get certified than there is certifiers. Uh, and that's is growing, but it's a slow growth process due to the fact of what I just shared with you. Um, the company that wants to be a C3PAO, they have to go through extensive accreditation process themselves. And it is a costly process also. So that's another piece of slowing down, having enough companies in place that can go out and do that requirement. I think right now it's like, uh, I think less than 100, if I'm correct. And it's growing, but that's where it is. And, and we're talking global. This isn't just U.S., this is global, because you can have a company in Europe that's doing business with the U.S., and they have to meet some of these requirements, too. So it's getting there, but it's not there, which is the same reason why they're not going to push hard on any company once it does go live uh, to have to meet all these stringent requirements, because the program itself is not stable enough to support the whole line of people that are waiting to get certified. So it's going to be a slow phase in approach, but it is going to take place. Thank you. Uh, our next question from C. Vickers. When does a company fall under DCSAAO versus CMMCAB? So the DCSA, that's a different realm. Um, if, if you're looking at it from the perspective of a company that's dealing with secret data, because DCSA are the ones that kind of manage a lot of the intel side and a lot of secret information getting approved for secret and top secret environments. Um, the requirements are pretty much the same because what DCSA is doing, they're using this 853, which is a much broader scope of a lot more controls than 800-171. 800-171 was born from NIST 853, and they condensed it down into the main areas that they felt at the time would meet a standard baseline security requirement for any organization doing business. DCSA is gonna use 853 and go through every control in there to get your organizational company certified to house secure data, being CIPR uh, or uh, secure, secret, or top secret information. So. If you're going to use the concept of DCSA's 853, you're going to hit 800-171, but you don't need all of that to be required to meet the 800-171 requirement for CMMC. Thank you. Um, there was a comment in the chat asking about CEUs or CLPs. 
Uh, CSI Act is not a <clears throat> is not a uh, accredited uh, educational uh, institution, but you will get a certificate for attending this webinar. Uh, we do think our trainings are relevant, so feel free to submit that um, for any of your certification purposes. Um, and we're at 115 now. Uh, okay. We appreciate Peter staying a little late. This will be the last question uh, before we end. Um, from C. Vickers, I heard some CMMC controls are not poemable. Is this the case? Um, well, every control is pro poemable, I guess, good way to put it. Um, if it's an NA, let's give you a great example. You may be an organization that does not do wireless or have any mobile access coming in and out of your environment. That would be an NA, non-applicable, but you need to justify why. So if you say our company does not use any wireless capabilities, okay, then that's understood. As long as you can justify that. So there will be some that kind of fall into that realm, but the majority of everything that you see out of that requirement for those controls, 14 families, you're going to have to meet those or at least be able to speak to them. All right. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. About 15, 16 minutes over, but uh, we appreciate this. Uh, we can tell by uh, the Q and A in the chat that this is something very um, pressing uh, within the DOD. Uh, mm -hmm. Feel free to reach back out to CSI, or if you want to get in touch with Peter, um, we we can make that happen as well. Um, please fill out the surveys, give us our feedback. Hopefully, you join us next month for our, for our next webinar. Um, and, and thanks to and thank you again to Mr. Bagley. Oh, my pleasure. And you guys can find me on LinkedIn out there. Connect up with me if I can help you in any way. I will, and if not, I'll try to feed you to people who can. Thanks all. Have a good one, guys. Thanks.